Network, this is Democracy Now! The blockage of the Suez Canal shows the complexity and brittleness of global trade. We should all be paying attention to who is going to be held accountable for this major accident, which is affecting not only trade, but the lives of people around the world. Hopes are rising that the Suez Canal in Egypt may soon be reopened after a 200,000 ton container ship was partially refloated. It's the size of the Empire State Building on its side. This sh we'll speak to Lala Khalili, author of Sinews of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula. Then we talk to UCLA professor Robin D.G. Kelly about the historic historic Amazon unionization drive and the history of radical black organizing in Alabama. The Amazon workers in Bessemer are leading the most consequential labor campaign of the 21st century. If you think about it, if this predominantly black, mostly female labor force can win uh, union recognition from the world's most powerful corporation in the anti-union South, workers can win anywhere. We will also look at the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin for killing George Floyd last May. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Minneapolis, opening statements begin today in the trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin, who killed George Floyd last May by kneeling on his neck for over nine minutes. Floyd's death set off a worldwide protest movement. Chauvin's charge with second- and third-degree murder, as well as manslaughter. National Guard troops have been deployed to the courthouse, which is also surrounded by concrete barriers, fencing, barbed and razor wire in anticipation of peaceful protests. George Floyd's family and friends came together yesterday for a vigil at a Minneapolis church. This is one of Floyd's brothers, Terrence Floyd. We're asking the system for the justice, but this gathering we're doing right now is what's needed. We're going to take not one knee, but both knees get down and we're going to ask God for the justice because our justice is, can't compare to his. In international news, in Burma, human rights groups say at least 114 people, including children, were killed Saturday as soldiers opened fire on civilians protesting against military rule in dozens of cities and towns across the country. It was the deadliest crackdown yet on protests, demanding a reversal of the February 1st coup, which toppled Burma's democratically elected civilian government. On Sunday, Burmese troops fired on a few funeral service for a 20-year-old student protester killed a day earlier near the commercial capital Rangoon. The attacks drew condemnation from the European Union, United States, U.K. and Germany, with the U.N. Special Rapporteur for Burma accusing the military regime of mass murder. Meanwhile, an estimated 3,000 people have fled southeastern Burma into Thailand after the Burmese military bombed areas controlled by the Karen ethnic minority group. At least 459 people, including at least 35 children, have been killed since the start of the protests against the coup. Six more states are opening up COVID-19 vaccine eligibility to anyone 16 or over today in the United States. Kansas, Louisiana, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma and Texas. At least three other states will do the same this week. Over 36 percent of U.S. adults have now received at least one dose of a vaccine. Officials are rushing to get shots in as many arms as possible, as over two dozen states report an increase of at least 10 percent in new infections compared to the previous week. New York and New Jersey, once the epicenter of the virus, are again leading in new infections. Dr. Deborah Birx, former President Trump's coronavirus coordinator, told CNN hundreds of thousands of U.S. COVID deaths may have been preventable. There were about 100,000 deaths that came from that original surge. All of the rest of them, in my mind, could have been mitigated or decreased substantially.
Nearly 550,000 deaths have been reported in the United States, by far the highest death toll in the world. Mexico published revised figures showing its coronavirus death toll to be 60 percent higher than previously reported. The new numbers would put Mexico's deaths at over 321,000, placing it second in overall fatalities ahead of Brazil and behind the U.S. Chile has imposed strict new lockdowns affecting 80 percent of the population amidst a major wave of cases, this despite Chile having one of the world's highest rates of vaccination. Health experts say the surge can be attributed to a lack of adherence to mitigation efforts and the spread of new variants. In Brazil, some researchers say the entire health system could collapse as infections and deaths continue to surge. Brazil recorded around a quarter of all COVID-19 deaths worldwide over the past two weeks. The World Health Organization warns COVID-19 cases are on the rise in at least 12 African nations and that a third wave could overwhelm already vulnerable health systems. South Africa has suffered the greatest toll, with over 52,000 deaths and over 1.5 million cases. Less than 1 percent of people living on the African continent have received a coronavirus vaccine. In Indonesia, a pair of suicide bombers attacked a Catholic church Sunday in the city of Makassar, injuring 20 people at a Palm Sunday mass marking the start of the Holy Week leading up to Easter. No groups claimed responsibility. But a senior police official blamed a group that's pledged allegiance to ISIS and was implicated in a string of deadly suicide bombings on Indonesian churches in 2018. In northern Mozambique, dozens of people are dead, thousands more displaced, after an armed group converged on the town of Palma in Cabo Delgado province. The fighters assaulted a military barracks, opened fire on civilians, set fire to buildings and hunted down government officials. Mozambique's military blamed an ISIS-aligned group for the attacks. Since 2017, fighting in northern Mozambique has left thousands dead and some 700,000 people displaced. Iran and China have signed an economic and security cooperation deal that will see China invest $400 billion in Iran over the next quarter century in exchange for regular deliveries of oil. The two nations will also set up an Iranian-Chinese bank that will help Iran circumvent U.S. sanctions that have largely cut it off from the global banking systems. The U.S. sanctions were imposed after President Trump unilaterally pulled out of the landmark 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Federal officials revealed a nine-year-old girl from Mexico drowned earlier this month as she attempted to cross the Rio Grande River into the U.S. The girl's mother, who's Guatemalan, and her three-year-old brother were also found unresponsive, but were able to be resuscitated. This comes as more than 18,000 unaccompanied migrant children are now in U.S. custody, according to the latest figures. Over 5,000 of those are in customs and border protection facilities, which are not equipped to care for children. Today is the deadline for mail-in ballots, as nearly 6,000 Amazon workers in Bessemer, Alabama, decide whether to form the company's first union. A yes vote could be a watershed moment for the U.S. labor movement. On Friday, Senator Bernie Sanders traveled to Bessemer. Your message to people all over this country is stand up and fight back. You're going to do it here. We can do it all over this country. We'll have more on this, as well as Derek Chauvin's trial, later in the broadcast with professor, historian and author Robin Kelly. In health care news, Bernie Sanders, who chairs the Senate Budget Committee, is pushing to lower Medicare eligibility from 65 to 55 years old, as well as expand the program to cover dental work, vision and hearing aids. The move would be included as part of Democrats' upcoming economic recovery plan. Tennessee has become the third state this month to impose new laws attacking transgender student-athletes, alongside Mississippi and Arkansas. Republican Governor Bill Lee signed the legislation Friday, which forces trans students to show legal documents revealing the sex they were assigned at birth in order to participate in middle and high school 
boards. 28 states across the country are voting on anti-trans bills this year. Trans advocates have launched a Transgender Week of Action ahead of International Trans Day of Visibility this Wednesday. A warning to our audience, the next story contains references to sexual violence. The Minnesota Supreme Court unanimously overturned a man's rape conviction, ruling he cannot be found guilty because the woman who accused him had voluntarily consumed alcohol before the rape. At the center of the ruling is a Minnesota law that states a person is only considered mentally incapacitated and unable to consent to sex if they've been given alcohol or other substances against their will. Sexual assault survivors and advocates say the ruling demonstrates the urgent need to update state laws. Renowned forensic psychiatrist Dr. Bandy Lee is suing Yale University after they terminated her employment following a complaint by Trump attorney Alan Dershowitz over one of her tweets from last year. The tweet said Trump supporters suffered a shared psychosis and suggested Dershowitz had, quote, wholly taken on Trump's symptoms by contagion. Yale University said Dr. Lee violated the American Psychiatric Association's Goldwater Rule, which says it's unethical to comment on a public figure's mental faculties without medical examination. Many psychiatrists, including Dr. Lee, have likened the rule to a gag order. She has frequently spoken out against Donald Trump's mental health, citing her civic duty to warn the public of potential dangers. She spoke to Democracy Now! about her lawsuit against Yale. Yale dismissed me after 17 years. I filed a lawsuit with a heavy heart against my alma mater because this is a matter of academic freedom and freedom of speech, which is our protection against authoritarianism and dangerous leadership. You can see our interviews with Dr. Bandy Lee at democracynow.org. House Democrats introduced the DeJoy Act Friday in a bid to block part of Postmaster General Louis DeJoy's 10-year plan to restructure the U.S. Postal Service. The legislation would prohibit the USPS from delaying mail delivery service from its current standard. DeJoy is also planning to raise postage costs. Prominent Democrats, including Senator Bernie Sanders, are calling for the Postal Board to fire DeJoy, a Trump and Republican megadonor with no prior Postal Service experience. Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth said, quote, DeJoy is a clear and present threat to the future of the Postal Service and the well-being of millions of Americans, she said. Dominion Voting Systems has filed a $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit against Fox News, accusing the network and its hosts of promoting false claims that the voting company rigged the 2020 election against Donald Trump. Dominion has also sued Trump ally My Pillow CEO Mike Lindell and lawyer Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani, who frequently promoted false conspiracy theories on Fox News. And here in New York, a group of activists and workers excluded from pandemic relief are completing 14 days on hunger strike today. Excluded workers include undocumented people, many of them in essential services, and people recently released from prison. They're calling on New York lawmakers to approve $3.5 billion in funding for financial relief and health care for those shut out of the current system. This is one of the hunger strikers. I want the world to know that we need help. We're human beings. We have so much debt because of the pandemic. We can't even enter our homes in comfort because they're waiting for us at the door to evict us. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. When we come back, hopes are rising that the Suez Canal in Egypt may soon be reopened after a 200,000-ton container ship was partially refloated. The ship is as long as the Empire State Building is high. We'll speak to Lala Khalili, author of Sinews of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula.
Nua Haman by Mariam Saleh. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Hopes are rising that the Suez Canal in Egypt may soon be reopened after an enormous container ship blocked the canal and now has partially refloated, uh, been refloated earlier today. The 200,000-ton ship, the Ever Given, got stuck six days ago, blocking one of the world's most important trade routes. The waterway, which opened in 1868, connects the Mediterranean with the Indian Ocean. More than 450 other container ships are waiting to enter the canal, which is used for about 12 percent of all global trade. Some ships have opted to sail around the Horn of Africa, instead of waiting for the Suez Canal to reopen. The impact of the canal shutdown is already being felt. Syria has begun to ration fuel after a Syria-bound ship carrying oil was prevented from entering the canal. The crisis has also raised new questions about global trade practices, including the reliance on massive cargo ships. The Ever Given is almost as long as the Empire State Building is high. The ship's cargo would extend for 75 miles if placed in a straight line. We go now to London, where we're joined by Lala Khalili, professor of international politics at the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. She's the author of several books, including most recently Sinews of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula. Halili's new piece for The Washington Post is headlined, Big Ships Were Created to Avoid Relying on the Suez Canal. Ironically, a big ship is now blocking it. Hello, Professor. It's great to have you with us. Can you start off by just describing what has happened in the Suez over this past week? Um, hi, Amy. I'm very happy to be with you today. So the ship um, was obviously in a convoy heading north from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, and it was carrying goods. It had um, its uh, point of origin was the port of Ningbo in China, and it had made a couple of stops in Malaysia on the way to Europe. Its destination is Rotterdam. As it got into the ship, there were massive winds blowing across the canal. There are transversal winds blowing across the canal. And um, of course, captains are quite experienced in trying to steer the ships. And one of the ways that they do this is by steering into the wind. I think in this instance, um, perhaps it didn't quite work out. And from what it seems like, that massive gust of wind resulted in the ship spinning a little bit, and that resulted in turn in uh, hydrodynamic problems down below the ship. So the ship ended up getting um, diagonally wedged. Uh, its its uh, prow got wedged in the east uh, uh, side of the canal, and its um, uh, aft, or its stern, um, was on the west side of the canal. And so it essentially cut off all movement um, across the canal uh, on Tuesday. And since then, there's been a lot of effort to try and refloat it. Um, and part of the problem has been that it has lodged on the side of the canal. Part of the problem is that the canal is kind of a, it's got a, um, it, its edges are not quite as deep as its center is. And so it's uh, being wedged at the front and the back in the side of the canal means that it needs to have uh, dredgers dig the sand and the mud around it in order to release it, and then it has to be refloated down the center of the canal, pushed forward or towed forward to one of the lakes that, is in, that are in the center of the canal in order for the convoys to resume uh, their movement across the Suez Canal. Um, the enormity of this ship, the Empire State Building on its side, if you can yeah. talk about how ships got this large, and also in the context of where it is right now, explain the significance and history of the Suez Canal and its uh, importance in global trade. So the Suez Canal, as uh, your uh, listeners probably know, uh, was actually dug by the French and the British in order to consolidate their imperial hold on Asian Africa. So that was um, intended to facilitate the connection between Mediterranean and Asian Africa. And when it was nationalized in 1956 by um, then uh, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, when uh, the, the British, the French and the Israelis attacked um, the canal, and the canal was shut down because there was war debris and ships in there. 
So that is really interesting and ironic because, of course, that moment is the moment at which a lot of shipping companies, this was the height of global trade. There was lots of oil flowing from the Middle East to Europe because, the, of course, this is the 1950s after the Second World War. Industries, again, taking uh, off in Europe. And so um, the canal was really crucial to these moments. And when it was shut down by that attack, um, the shipping companies started looking at ways to make the rounding of the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa, make it more economically viable. And so the economies of scale dictated the creation of these mega ships. And as years have gone by, the ships have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger because this, of course, is much more profitable for shipping companies. Uh, so it's kind of ironic that these very large mega ships that have been created have caused also the closure of the canal. Now, in terms of what the canal does, the canal is uh, connects, of course, Asia and uh, Europe. Uh, it's the shortest route between Asia and Europe. And part of the reason that it is so significant is because, as you mentioned earlier, 12% of global trade um, passes through it. But it's one of the three most important routes, the other two being transatlantic and transpacific routes for the movement of goods. Of course, as also your listeners know, China and East Asia, East and Southeast Asia, are now the factories of the world. And so a lot of manufactured good is produced there. And, of course, there is the oil that flows not only northward, not only from the Middle East and go the Gulf, but also, for example, Azeri oil or Kazakh oil that come from uh, the Black Sea and Libyan oil that comes from the Mediterranean flows south to go to Asia. So it's still quite a significant artery of global trade. Can you talk about the economic toll overall of what this means and what you see happening next, a kind of reckoning taking place, or will there be? So I, I hope that there will be a reckoning. Usually such uh, massive kind of issues that, um, that end up uh, affecting global trade tend to have some after echoes. Um, although there have been other instances of ships um, having gotten stuck in the canal and being released, but none have taken as long as this one has. Now, the reason that this is quite significant, obviously the very first um, category of uh, sort of people who are hurt by this are, is the Egyptian government that collects something like 700 thousand dollars per ship's passage in the canal. So if you've got 400 ships waiting to, to pass, it's that much of the fees that the Egyptian uh, government is not collecting uh, from the Suez Canal. There are, of course, other um, uh, victims of this, if you will. And I think that those are those have often been forgotten. So, uh, And those are the seafarers that are sitting on these ships. I think it's really important to acknowledge, and very few people have done, that seafarers have had some of the hardest um, months of work in the last uh, year or so, because with the closure of ports and airports, they have been stuck on board ships, sometimes for months after their contracts have ended, um, sometimes without being paid wages. And so the fact that now, again, there are going to be delays, that, 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 that they could potentially not be able to fly home at the time that they have, I think that it's really important to acknowledge that they are, um, uh, they, they tend to, this has worked to their detriment in a great and major way. And of course, there are others, uh, what we hear about, for example, just in time production of automobiles in Europe has been one of the um, categories of manufacturing that has been hurt by this. And of course, uh, clean gasoline that comes northward through the canal um, has there, there are going to be delays in the delivery of those. And so there are there are a number of very specific categories of um, sort of manufacturing that have been affected. One final thing is that, and we don't know the exact um, whether or not this is the case, but we also know that India is right now one of the world's biggest pharmaceutical manufacturing locations, and we know that um, India is where a, a, a great uh, percentage of the world's various vaccines, um, COVID vaccines, are being manufactured. So it is also possible that some of the ships that are awaiting passage through the canal, there might be some that are also carrying vaccines and are awaiting uh, passage. So there are, we, we'll, the, the picture is going to be a lot more clear after the flow has started and we have a better sense of what cargo is being carried on the ships that have been delivered or ships that have had to be rerouted around the Cape of Good Hope. But at the moment, those are all the possible areas where there could be a delay, um, and, and there are people that have been hurt by that process. I want to go to Osama Rabi, chairman of the Suez Canal Authority, speaking at a news conference Saturday. Regarding the case of the accident, strong winds and sandstorm were not the main cause, and there might be technical failures and mechanical problems of the vessel or other human factors, but these specific reasons has not been identified yet. Weather is only part of the complicated causes of the accident. 
Can you respond to what he is saying, and then also talk about who owns this ship? Um, what flag is flown on this ship? So I think the question of flags and ownership is really quite important because it really affects the who is going to be held responsible for this. So the ship is actually owned by a Japanese company. It is operated by a Taiwan-based um, shipping company called Evergreen, which is one of the world's biggest shipping um, sh uh, freight carriers. But the ship itself um, is, uh, and, and of course, it has agents that are based in the Gulf, and it has uh, ship management staff that are German. So it's a kind of an international, if you will. It's, it's an international of different kinds of corporations. But what is quite significant is that the ship flies, uh, flies the flag of Panama. Panama is what the International Transport Workers Federation considers to be a flag of convenience or an open registry. Open registries are ship registries that allow for companies that are not necessarily based in Panama to actually register their ships there. And part of the reason that this is very inviting to a lot of companies is because there are the regulations on um, labor and on environmental stuff is quite lax in uh, the ship registry. Registries, the sort of requirements, the, the requirement thresholds for insurance, etc., are quite low. Um, and taxation is, I mean, essentially, open ship registries are a kind of a subcategory of offshore havens, if you will. And in fact, when they were first invented, the biggest uh, sort of users of the ship registries were the Standard Oil of California and the banana boats of uh, United Fruit. So it has always been embedded in a kind of a capitalist accumulation, and it has always encouraged this kind of uh, accumulation of capital without necessary accountability. Um, one of the things that is also significant about the flag of Panama is that your readers probably, your listeners probably remember that last year there was a ship that also grounded on the island of Mauritius um, and there was a spillage of fuel on these incredibly sensitive, uh, you know, environmentally sensitive areas. That ship was also flying the flag of Panama. And again, it becomes a question of who is going to be held accountable for this and who's going to um, actually uh, end up responding to, to this problem, which uh, is it going to be the owners? Is it going to be the ship's operators? Is it going to be uh, the flag of Panama, which is responsible for uh, investigating this? So if anything that can come out of this process is if more scrutiny of these open registries, that would probably be a, a, a very important and a very good thing. Professor Kalili, can you talk about the people on board the ship, the sailors, the workers, um, the working conditions on these massive ships? So um, I actually went down the Suez Canal a couple of times as part of my research in 2015 and 2016. And what is really striking is that in a ship that huge, which is essentially as big as a small town, you only have somewhere between 30 to 35 people working on, a, on the ship, which is an astonishing um, uh, uh, statistic if you think about it. Sometimes actually not even as many as that. But usually a container ship has a lot uh, more people because particularly if, if there are things like refrigerated containers, they have to make sure that the refrigerated containers continue to refrigerate, despite, for example, um, uh, issues with fuel. There are, of course, people in the engine room that are um, maintaining these massive engines. And then, of course, there are the crew and the officers who make sure that the ship is not rusted, maintain the ship. The officers, of course, um, are, are responsible for the ship's arrival um, and uh, into and departure from ports and, and, of course, steering the ship. The work aboard these ships, of course, requires enormous skill. And the particularly the bigger the ship is, of course, it requires more skill. And the, the, sh the shipping companies tend to obviously hire people that have uh, quite a, a extraordinary abilities are professionally um, astonishing. But one of the things that has happened is that over the course of um, uh, the, since the 1970s and 80s, essentially these ships, working conditions aboard the ships have, has become such that you have two layers of workers. You have the officers and then you have the crew. And the officers nowadays, especially for ships that are flagged to Europe, tend to come from Eastern Europe. They tend to be uh, cheaper. They receive uh, lower wages than, for example, a German or a British. British officer or French officer. So they tend to come from often from the former Yugoslavia. And the crew uh, tends to come from the global south. Um, uh, the two countries that, pr that, that provide the largest number of uh, seafaring crews to the, to the world are uh, Philippines uh, and China. And so you have uh, crew members that tend to come from the Philippines and China. And the contracts that they have tend to be quite long. So the crew members are often on the ship for 11 months before they can fly home for a month or two to see their families. And so this is also, as 
as you can imagine, this is quite, you know, this if, if they are going, if they were going to be going home soon thereafter, this is going to be a source of stress for them because, of course, they're delayed by a week and potentially longer than that. And so the working conditions aboard the ships you know, it, it uh, is, is also a kind of a, a condition of possibility of these shipping, but it has a lot of tedium, it has a lot of hard work, it has a lot of skills, but it has a lot of also anxiety associated with it. I wanted to end on a different issue, uh, Lala Khalili, and that is a piece that you uh, just wrote um, in, <clears throat> about, talking about U.S.-China relations and the London Review um, of books titled Growing Pains, The Emperor's New Road, China and the Project of the New Century. On Friday, President Biden told reporters he discussed plans with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson to counter China's massive Belt and Road Initiative. One of the things I suggest that we do is we talked about China and the competition they're engaging in, the Belt and Road Initiative, and I suggest that we should have essentially a, a similar initiative coming from the democratic states, helping those communities around the world that, in fact, need help. Professor Khalili, your response? So it's quite interesting because it seems to me that the U.S. military industrial diplomatic complex has always wanted another enemy, has, and it benefits from having another Cold War going. And so to cast China's um, provision of, for example, infrastructures in order to facilitate its trade uh, seems to be a kind of an encouragement of this. Of course, there are lots of problems also associated with China's Belt and Road Initiative. For example, in some of the places that um, in these investments are happening, there are all sorts of human rights. Um, abuses happening, including and briefly China's explain the Belt and Road Initiative, which is not explained at all in the media in the United States very much. So the Belt and Road Initiative is essentially a, uh, a plan that was put into action in the 2013 to actually gather under its title a whole lot of already existing infrastructure projects across uh, the Asian uh, Eurasian landmass, all the way to Europe, uh, for infrastructure and particularly transport projects. So high-speed rail, uh, train lines that went through different terminuses and would, for example, end up in Singapore and in Iran and in Budapest, and then across uh, the ocean. Uh, the South uh, China Sea and uh, the Indian Ocean and through the Mediterranean, um, essentially a route for ships, so investment in uh, port and maritime infrastructures. And so this was called the maritime belt and maritime, uh, so the land belt and the maritime road. And so this, uh, uh, essentially, this massive pro program entailed investment financing by China uh, close, uh, actually, to how much, uh, 400 and something billion billion uh, dollars, close to actually what the World Bank had invested in that period of time on infrastructures. And part of the reason for this, of course, is that many of these countries did need infrastructures, and they're often not given it because of sanctions or because of U.S. foreign policy or because of, uh, of course, histories of European colonization of a lot of the places that are destinations for this investment. And so this is essentially the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Of course, it facilitates Chinese capital accumulation. It's not, you know, done out of Chinese goodness. And as I said, it does also have in areas, for example, in Baluchistan and Pakistan or in their um, various provinces in Myanmar or indeed in Xinjiang, there are issues associated with this. But it's also the way that it is being cast, the way that it's being addressed in Europe and North America is as if uh, China is sort of the next great enemy. It's really important also to point out that uh, China, despite sort of this expansion, has not, for example, established uh, uh, I don't know, 800 uh, military bases like the U.S. has done in lots of different places, but rather it does have one or two military bases outside of its own uh, periphery, but it also depends on private military companies. So it's quite an interesting uh, moment because uh, essentially what China is doing is uh, the enforcement of capitalism with the Chinese face, if you wish, uh, but it is seen as a threat um, to uh, the U.S. national security, perhaps because, as I said, that uh, a Cold War is always good for the military business um, in the U.S. and Europe. Well, Lala Khalili, we want to thank you for being with us, author of Sinews of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula. And we'll link to your piece in The Washington Post. Big ships <clears throat> were created to avoid relying on the Suez Canal. Ironically, a big ship is now blocking it. 
Professor Khalili teaches international politics at the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. When we come back, we'll speak with UCLA professor Robin D.G. Kelly about the historic Amazon unionization drive and the history of radical black organizing in America. We'll also talk about the first day of opening arguments of the Derek Chauvin trial. Stay with us. Liston. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today is the deadline for mail-in ballots, as nearly 6,000 Amazon workers in Bessemer, Alabama, decide whether to form the company's first union. A yes vote could be a watershed moment for the U.S. labor movement. On Friday, Senator Bernie Sanders traveled to Bessemer to speak at a rally and called the unionization drive a historical struggle. If history teaches us anything, is that big money and trust do not give you anything. You got to stand up and fight for it. And in this, the wealthiest country in the history of the world, dealing with the wealthiest individual in the world, there is no excuse for workers at Amazon not to have good wages good benefits and good working conditions. And if you pull this off here, Birmingham, Alabama, if you pull this off here, believe me, workers all over this country are going to be saying, if these people in Alabama could take on the wealthiest guy in the world, we can do it as well. Joining Senator Sanders were workers who make an average of $15.30 an hour. Upwards of 80 percent of the Bessemer workers are black. The majority are women. Their push to unionize comes as Amazon founder and CEO Jeff Bezos saw his fortune soar by $75 billion in 2020 in the pandemic is set to become the world's first trillionaire within this decade. He's already the world's richest person. This is Amazon worker Linda Burns. I had to get a second job. They're taking out two Bessemer tax, Birmingham tax. They're taking out insurance. They're taking out stocks. They're taking out all that stuff. When they get through, guess what? I may have $300. $300 is not enough to live on. We all know that. I'm tired, but I'm not tired. And I'm going to fight for my rights, for our rights. For my employees, I'm fighting for all of us. I want America to know we all in this together. We're not alone. And I thank God for all the support and help that we are getting, because we need it, because we cannot fight Bezos by ourselves. Another high-profile supporter of the Amazon unionization drive has been rapper Killer Mike, who spoke at Friday's rally in Bessemer about what is at stake with today's vote. I want their vote to go through, but if it doesn't, I won't be ordering from Amazon again. If that vote does not go through, if these conditions do not improve, then I'll just be walking on out to the store with my mask on. But what I won't do is, by being a customer, enable the richest man in the fastest growing company to use slave labor any longer. These people have been treated as badly as my grandmother when she sharecropped in this same state. These people have been denied the basic laboratory rights that you would allow any child going to school in an eight-hour day. These people, in the name of the convenience of 
getting dropped at our door are being used and abused as though they're tools and their life can be thrown away because it's peak season. So what I'm going to tell the public, past the union, past Mr. Bezos, is if they won't treat their people right, who are we if we stand on the side of evil just to get a package to our door two days? The tech and retail giant Amazon has been fighting the union drive. Voting counting begins tomorrow and could take many days. Well, for more on this historic moment and the history of radical black organizing in Alabama, we're joined by Robin D.G. Kelly, professor of history at UCLA, who studies social movements and author of many books, including Hammer and Ho, Alabama Communists During the Great Depression, in which he describes an earlier high-stakes union battle in Bessemer, Alabama. Alabama, when thousands of workers walked off the job at the massive iron and steel companies in Bessemer and nearby Birmingham in the 1930s to demand union recognition and higher pay. Professor Kelly is also author of Freedom Dreams, the Black Radical Imagination. Professor, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Talk about the okay. significance of this struggle today and put in the context of the history, not only of radical organizing in Alabama, but in Bessemer itself. Right, right. No, no, this is definitely the most significant uh, labor struggle of the 21st century, no doubt. In fact, um, uh, this is the largest NLRB election in three decades. I mean, because this is a big plan. You're talking about 5,800, 6,000 workers. Now, in terms of, of Bessemer, Bessemer basically is part of Greater Birmingham. So it's hard to separate the two. Uh, these were industrial sections of of a state that actually has long and continued to have the largest unionization rate of of any southern state. Now, one of the things that we we, we make this mistake of thinking the South is as like backwards as conservative, but the South has been the epicenter of the country's most radical democratic movements, which is why it's completely you know unsurprising that Bessemer, Alabama, would be the place where you'd have a kind of renewed labor movement, where the, the fight against the largest corporation would begin, um, because the South is where you have long struggles, not just in, in Alabama, but waterfront workers in New Orleans and Charleston, workers in the rural areas. But in Bessemer in particular, uh, this is really the home of the International Mine Mill and Smelter Workers Union, uh, which was formed in part with the help of the Communist Party. And I want to really emphasize that what makes the history of Alabama unionization important was the role of the left. You know, the fact is, um, the, the reason why we have anti-labor legislation, we have violence against labor in, in Alabama, what appears to be conservatives, uh, the reason we have uh, Jim Crow and the disfranchisement of black people, the most draconian anti-immigration laws, is precisely because those who rule the South know the potential of an interracial labor movement, because they've seen it. Uh, to go back to the 1930s, two things made a difference. The Communist Party, as I mentioned, because communists who were down there, black and white, mostly black, uh, did not join the party or build a union because they were involved in some kind of economic calculation. Uh, they were fighting not for themselves, but fighting for each other. They were fighting for a better, less oppressive world. And in many ways, their, their activism really mobilized uh, the labor movement in, in Bessemer and Birmingham. The other factor, of course, was the New Deal. And we have to remember that under the New Deal, under Roosevelt, this was the friendliest period of federal government relationship to, to labor. Um, that didn't mean it wasn't a bloody struggle, but it, what it meant was that this is when you get the National Labor Relations uh, Board as a result of the Wagner Act. This is when um, certain unfair practices are outlawed. So in thinking about uh, the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers Union, uh, they also went up against a behemoth, in this case, the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, which was sort of equivalent to the Amazon of its day. It's a subsidiary of U.S. Steel. The company used police violence, uh, private security. Uh, they used um, other kinds of intimidation tactics 
especially around uh, uh, racial division. Uh, and also, uh, they were allowed to develop company unions, which under the Wagner Act was, was legal. And those company unions, of course, they failed. They tried to, draw, to, to, to drive a wedge between black and white workers. They couldn't do it. What ultimately undermined uh, the mine mill and smelter workers, and this is a very important part of the story, was anti-communism. When the Taft-Hartley Act was passed in 1947, it really undid a lot of the labor protections of the Wagner Act. It, it, it you know, outlawed secondary boycotts. It outlawed closed shops, sympathy strikes. And most importantly, it required union officers to sign these loyalty oaths, uh, these affidavits affirming that they're not communists. And leaders who did not sign um, would lose access to the NL, NLRB protections. And those same unions, mine mill among them, were kicked out of the CIO in 1949, in part with the help of the NAACP. <laughs> and this is, this is a story that is relevant to today because, of course, Jeff Bezos gave a lot of money to black organizations during the, the uh, Black Spring in June of 2020. Uh, finally, it's not an accident that after Taft-Hartley, after the, the push out of Mine Mill, uh, which really weakened the labor movement in Bessemer, that's when Alabama becomes a right-to-work state, 1953. The story doesn't end there, because even after that, you have a period of deindustrialization, concentrated poverty, the loss of industrial jobs, ongoing struggles against state violence. And then you get a new set of organizations that emerge, like the Jefferson County Welfare Rights Organization, uh, Alabama Economic Action Committee, the Southern Organizing Committee for Economic Justice. These are the organizations that, in, in many ways, laid the foundation for a kind of civil rights, social justice, black power kind of union organizing, uh, and, and, and also multiracial organizing, which really laid the foundation for what's happening in Bessemer uh, with the Amazon, uh, Amazon workers. What do you expect to come out, as you follow this closely, of this, um, of the vote? Well, you know, um, I suspect that R RDWSD will win. Um, but winning is not always uh, winning, for sure. I mean, when you think about what's at stake, um, if they win the vote, there's no possible way that Amazon's going to kind of lay, lay down and kind of let things happen. What typically happens is, one, Amazon's going to uh, contest the election. Uh, and even if they lose, it doesn't mean that they're going to win a contract. Um, they, they, because you know, unions have to have a bargaining agreement, a bargaining agreement, um, and it's not uncommon for unions to win recognition and, like, a year later, not have have a contract. Um, and it's quite possible, though unlikely, that Amazon could say, you know what, we don't want a union here, so we're going to up and leave. Now, that's the, that's the dark side. The the light side of all this is that um, the genie's out of the bottle. There's uh, there's already efforts to unionize at other Amazon plants. The momentum of this campaign uh, has really rev like revamped and, and revitalized uh, the labor movement in, in across the country. Um, and so Amazon has lost in many ways. Even if the, the vote is negative, Amazon still has lost. Um, because now we have a kind of popular uh, a national dis uh, uh, discourse, a, a conversation about why unions make a difference. Uh, and one of the things that I think it's important to remember is that Amazon tries to sell itself as like the pro-worker, uh, progressive organization. And they're, in fact, um, they have signs up uh, around the plant, and not just that plant, but other plants, saying, you know, we, we support Congress's push for a $15 minimum wage um, so that they can come up to, to our wages. Well, the fact of the matter is that unionized labor, who, warehouse workers, poultry workers in Bessemer and around Bessemer make more money 
than $15 an hour. $20 an hour is prevailing wage for unionized labor. So if you're in the union, you're going to make more money. Um, black workers make black workers who are unionized make 16% more than those who are not. So the fact of the matter is that it's all based on a kind of a lie. Uh, the lie that that Amazon is pushing is that uh, all these workers are going to lose $500 a year on dues, and no one's going to know what happens to those dues. And those dues could be used to pay for groceries. If you can make $20 an hour and control the pace of work and uh, create worker protections, say, and, and provide, restore the $2 an hour hazard pay that they rescinded back in May, if you can do all that, then it doesn't really matter. You know, you can pay, you can buy your groceries, you can pay your rent. But right now, they're paying starvation wages at $15 an hour, which is not that much money in the first place. Perfect. So, yeah, go ahead. No, Professor Kelly, I wanted to move on to a couple of other subjects before we end today. Um, for, uh, I, I want to turn to the opening statements beginning today in Minneapolis for the trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin, who killed George Floyd last May by kneeling on his neck for over nine minutes. Floyd's death set off worldwide protest movement. Uh, Chauvin is charged with second- and third-degree murder, as well as manslaughter. The jury made up of one black woman, three black men, three white men, six white women, and two women who identify as multiracial. George Floyd's family and friends came together yesterday for a vigil in Minneapolis. This is one of Floyd's brothers, Terrence Floyd. We're asking the system for the justice. But this gathering we're doing right now is what's needed. We're going to take not one knee, but both knees. Get down, and we're going to ask God for the justice, because our justice is, can't compare to his. Still with us, UCLA professor Robin D.G. Kelly, can you respond to what's happening today in Minneapolis to this trial? Sure. Um, first, I'm not really holding my breath over whether or not Derek Chauvin will be convicted. I mean, the jury selection is pretty extraordinary. I mean, given the history of jury selection in this country, it's it's great that it's a little bit more representative. But there are two important things to keep in mind. One is that the fact that the city has already provided a settlement um, to the Floyd family suggests some effort at accountability. Uh, but this trial is not so much about accountability. It's about whether or not the killing reaches a threshold of second-degree murder. Uh, but, you know, and I'm not, I have to say, I'm not excited about anyone being in a cage, uh, you know, even if you're a killer. Um, that, to me, is not the victory. The real victory, the real victory would be to end policing as we know it, to end qualified immunity, to end the conditions that enabled Derek Chauvin to take George Floyd's life and his colleagues to kind of stand there and watch, and to really divest from the kind of death-dealing systems like policing and invest in life-sustaining policies uh, in institutions that make us safe. I mean, that, to me, that hasn't been lost. And that's what that struggle was about in the first place. And to me, that's what could vindicate, uh, if, it, if vindication is even possible, uh, the, 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 the murder of, of George Floyd. And I also wanted to ask you about this historic moment in Evanston, Illinois, historic for the whole country. The city council has agreed to, play, to pay black residents reparations for historic housing discrimination, making it the first U.S. city to adopt such a measure. We talked to Evanston City Council member Robin Ruth Simmons Friday about this vote. What we passed actually was in 2019. Uh, a resolution to provide reparations to black Evanston residents. Uh, we passed it with funding from our cannabis sales tax with an initial commitment of $10 million. Um, and what we passed on this last Monday was the first disbursement or the first remedy, which is going to be in the form of a housing remedy, $25,000 direct benefits to eligible black residents um, for home equity, home wealth, uh, acquisition or purchase, any type of improvement, but something that will uh, build wealth through, through home equity. Professor Kelly, your response to what's taken place, and do you see this as a grassroots approach to dealing with this from the bottom up, considering federally it has not been dealt with? 
Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think it's historic, and, and we're seeing the same thing happening, beginning to happen in places like Vermont uh, and, and elsewhere across the country. Um, Ten million dollars. That's a good start. Uh, and, and I get the I get the idea, which is that you know that part of what this reparations campaign is trying to do is address the wealth gap, uh, especially around real estate. Um, but I have to say, I'm a little bit. Um, I'm concerned sometimes because one, when you pay out rich, when reparations are paid, sometimes that shuts down all conversations about other kinds of inequalities uh, that are produced by historic racism. Um, and we have to ask ourselves really hard questions. Like, for example, what does it mean to secure black property ownership as reparations on stolen land? Um, how does that change kind of racialized property values? I mean, if the property values in black communities are still lower, how do you address that? Um, if even if you can provide people startup money to put down on a home, how do we address the reasons why black people are poorer and go to inferior schools? How do we disentangle, say, property values and property taxes from school expenditures uh, or, or, or school budgets? Like how, how we actually fund schools? Um, and then we have we have the, the 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 wealth gap. We also have the wage gap. And part of what I'm going to talk I have this conversation with with uh, Reverend William Barber this afternoon at uh, three o'clock um, about the Amazon workers. But it's also about you know how do we address these kinds of gaps, even you know through um, multiracial working class organizing? Because my question, of course, is. Will these repra will reparations ensure not just equality, but the, the, the dismantling of the kind of uh, racialized structures that devalued our lives, our, 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 our experiences, our property, our, our wages in the first place? I mean, you know, and this is something that is really important because racialized wage differentials are also compounded by gender. Um, how are we going to address that? Um, that women make women of color make black women make less money. Um, how do we deal with other kinds of, of violences, sexual violence, for example, uh, reproductive violence? Uh, you know, that's that goes way beyond the loss of, of property. Now, so I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm just simply saying, as we move forward. This is just the beginning and opening for a larger question. And, Professor Kelly, before we end, I wanted to ask you about the piece you wrote in the Boston Review, headlined, Why Cornell West's Tenure Fight Matters. Earlier this month, Cornell West announced he'll leaving Harvard to re rejoin Union Theological Seminary after he was denied tenure at Harvard. Uh, in this last 40 seconds we have, explain. Right. right. Very quickly, I, I think um, Dr. West shows enormous integrity uh, by making a decision to leave Harvard to go to, to Union, go back to Union in, in many ways. Um, why do I say that? Because he could have stayed at Harvard. He, I mean, the chances of him being fired are pretty slim, and he understands that. He was making a larger statement about what tenure is supposed to represent. That is the protection of our uh, inte intellectual and academic freedom. And there's a relationship between the story you tell, told about uh, Bandy Lee, for example, with Cornell West, that if we can't speak out, if we can't do our work and make controversial stance Three seconds. and not be protected, then we don't need tenure. Robin D.G. Kelly, professor of history at UCLA, who studies social movements. That does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.